if you've studied physics for very long, you've heard Einstein's lie of space curvature. In reality, it's not necessary to have space curvature in order to explain general relativistic effects. And historically, it's quite interesting that in 1907 to 1911 time frame, when Einstein started working on general relativity, he worked on it from a perspective that the speed of light slows rather than there being space curvature. But of course, he recognized that that conflicted with the special theory of relativity. So he decided that he didn't want to retract his special theory of relativity, and instead he developed general relativity on the basis of length contraction of space and space curvature, both of which are not true. And the reason they're not true, if we can start with the definition of space itself. Space is essentially in literary definition, a boundless region that contains all matter. Space itself is not matter, and that's one of Einstein's assumptions, was that space does not contain ether, it does not contain matter, and that space itself is not matter. Yet, he came up with the imaginary idea that space still had dimensions and still had clocks, so it still had time. So then he took this idea of these imaginary dimensions that he couldn't explain in any physical way uh, and then developed a theory around that, or two theories, special relativity and general relativity, based on imaginary distances and imaginary clocks. Now, those of us who are real physicists prefer to work from physical dimensions and physical clocks that are real, that emerge somehow in space. And that's actually fairly easy to do because the quantum field exists. And I've done other videos that give the evidence for that. My favorite is the Casimir effect because it shows that uh, space participates in van der Waals forces, which means that it has to be filled with dipoles and these dipoles interact with each other so that they wiggle depending on the charge orientation. And that causes pressure that pushes bodies together, which causes electromagnetic acceleration that accelerates bodies together or apart, depending on differentials and pressure. And so the Casimir effect is extremely important to understanding the physics of the quantum field and physics in general. The quantum fluctuations that make up the quantum field have wavelengths and frequencies. And frequencies is in cycles per second. So by having frequencies, it means that the quantum fluctuations have a property of time. So the quantum field, just by itself in space, gives space physical dimensions and time. And even more importantly, those physical dimensions and time dimensions emerge from the quantum field and the quantum field's properties. It's, they don't come from any independent source. They don't need an outside interaction. And that's because since we have a field filled with dipoles, that if you have a dipole and you move a charge, the dipole is going to move when the charge moves by. And, but for a dipole to move, that's surrounded by other dipoles, then other dipoles have to move. So for each dipole to move, many, 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 many dipoles have to move. And the dipoles don't want to move because that requires energy. And so there's resistance to motion. And this motion is in the form of a quantum van der Waals torque. Now, van der Waals torques aren't normally talked about in terms of their importance to quantum field theory. Uh, they're better known in chemistry, but they are physically real, and, and certainly in chemistry, they've been shown to be uh, necessary. Well, it turns out they're very necessary to quantum field theory as well, because the torque limits linear motion, it limits rotational motion, it 
since rotational motion of dipoles leads to polarization of space, it limits how fast the electric fields can propagate. And since rotating dipoles form quantum magnets, the quantum torque limits how fast magnetic fields can propagate. So the permittivity and permeability constants, which tell us what the limit of polarization and magnetization of space, are due to the quantum torque. And because the speed of light is a function of permittivity and permeability, it's also a function of the quantum torque. And all these things arrive arise or emerge naturally from the quantum field without any external source of information or additional uh, source of physical constants. But most importantly, when we're talking about relativity and general relativity, the dimensions and clocks of space emerge from the quantum field. And so we have a choice in physics when we deal with relativity and general relativity, we can either use Einstein's imaginary clocks and rulers, or we can use the physical clocks and rulers of quantum field theory to develop the theory. And given a choice like that in physics, we must choose the real physical clocks. Imaginary physics is not physics. So, what that means is space by itself has no dimensions. Although it's important to note that space cannot exist by itself, space always contains quantum field theory as far as we can determine. There's no such thing as empty space. And so dimensionless space, since it has no dimensions, it can't, those dimensions can't contract or expand. So there's no length contraction. And I just did a video on length contraction that covers a lot of the same material. And because space has no dimensions and it can't link contract, it can't curve either. But we have a problem in physics that after more than 100 years of people hearing about space curvature and, and it being a lot of pop science culture and, uh, and a lot of interesting things come out of it, in, that are really science fiction, but there's this whole culture about it. There is, um, it's verging on a religion about space curvature. But if we're real scientists and we want to say that we have a physical cause of the physical dimensions of space and the physical clocks of space, we have to start over with relativity theory with those physical clocks and dimensions which is where Einstein started out his investigations of general relativity in 1907 and unfortunately abandoned that approach. And what we find is that if you, there are two ways to do general relativity and general relativity arises because when there's a body of matter that increases the torque locally, which slows the speed of light locally by increasing the permittivity and permeability. And it also changes the dielectric constant, which can mean that light bends because of a dielectric constant change, not because of the space curvature change. And so what we find when we study general relativity is that there are two ways to get to the general relativistic answers. One is you assume space curvature and clock slowing. On the other hand, you assume the speed of light changes along with permittivity and permeability, and you also have clock slowing. And either one of those approaches using these two things can give you the right answers. But some of Einstein's assumptions, such as space curvature, are false when we use quantum field theory. The other advantage with quantum field theory, in addition to having physically real dimensions and clock rates, is that it's electromagnetic phenomena. That those wavelengths and frequencies are described as part of electromagnetic theory of 
quantum field theory in general. And so if we use the quantum field dimensions and clocks to explain special and general relativity, or it should be regular relativity, special relativity uh, shouldn't be a thing because it has too many false assumptions. But the relativistic effects and the general relativistic effects can be described entirely as electromagnetic phenomena. We don't have to have any imaginary space. In fact, we shouldn't have imaginary space. So the, advantage, the other advantage of using that is by using the quantum fields, dimensions, and clocks, we unify relativity and general relativity theory with electromagnetic theory. And the thing is, is that physicists have known about this for a long time. They, those who have studied Einstein know that, that he developed this alternative to general relativity, or partially developed it, in 1907-1911. Um, for example, he recognized in a 1911 paper that half of the bending of light could be due to clock slowing, uh, not clock slowing, speed of light slowing, essentially changing of the, of the dielectric constant in space, which causes light to curve. Just as changing in dielectric constant causes light to change direction when it enters a body of water or, or clear glass lens or something of that nature. So, but what he didn't realize is that if he also had a clock slowing term in there, then he'd get the factor of two that he ultimately came up with in his, his final form of general relativity. And so when we do consider both the dielectric constant changing and the clock slowing, we get the correct bending of light term. And there's one of the more interesting proofs of general relativity is the Shapiro delay, in which light is delayed as it passes the sun. And under general relativity, they say that the links are contracted so that the actual distance travel is many kilometers shorter than it would be, that the space disappears, it becomes shorter. But under quantum field theory, the wavelengths of the light change, the wavelengths become shorter, and the clocks become slower. So the light experiences two forms of delay due to the wavelength being more compact and the speed of light slowing, which gives the Shapiro delay. <coughs> and in this way, it's possible to explain all the photon-based general relativi relativistic effects quite simply as electromagnetic phenomena. So I also wanted to mention that the quantum field has a restroom. And that's, a, that's part of the reason that special relativity doesn't work, uh, because it denies the existence of a restroom. But when we have a quantum field full of dipoles, those dipoles have a, a frame of reference in which they're at their lowest energy and where the torque is the lowest. And then if a body moves, the torque appears to increase because the dipoles appear to be rotating preferentially in one direction. And, but given that we have one rest frame, the rest frame is where the dimensions and time of space are determined. So in this rest frame, there's a baseline of, of physical dimensions, clocks, permittivity, permeability, speed of lights at the maximum, so all those things are fixed. And an observer moving relative to the rest frame does not change the dimensions in the rest frame. So when we're doing relativity, relativistic physics, we can say that the dimensions in the rest frame are fixed and use that as a standard frame of reference whenever we're doing uh, relativistic transformations. Now it becomes more interesting in general relativity because Anytime you have a body in matter, that increases the torque. So if there's 
a local body of matter distributed, that does change the distribution of the torque and the speed of light, even in the restroom. So we must consider the, those phenomena in order to get a complete quantum field theory that is, accounts for general relativistic effects. I'll discuss general relativity more in another video. Um, but we're in a situation where physicists could, if they wanted to unify general relativity with quantum field theory, but they have to do away with space curvature and they don't want to lose their religion and do that. Um, but if anyone is telling you about space curvature, you can tell them it's a lie. It's science fiction that the dimensions of space are determined by the quantum field, not by some imaginary dimensions that, that you just pretend are there. And so it's important that physics Physicists recognize that we do have a path forward to unify general relativity and electromagnetic theory, and we need to do that. Well, I hope you liked the video. I know this is a little more complex than some of my other ones, uh, but if you do, please share, like, subscribe. And if you'd like to know more about physics, um, I and quantum field theory in particular, you can check out one of my books. I have a few there. And my latest one's on particle theory. I won't go into it here, but I will in future videos. So thank you very much for listening.